And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. Let me tell you, when you can easily take that truth in, you're in a bad spot spiritually. If that doesn't just resonate in your heart, uh, you're in a very dangerous place. Um, and, and it's a, quite a shame. You need to be very careful there. I'd like us to turn in our Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. Occasionally I find myself doing dumb things. I discovered myself doing a dumb thing tonight, although I did not know I was doing a dumb thing for some time. Uh, I managed to get reading assignments confused, and I've been reading the wrong section. <laughs> and uh, that's been a rather significant length of time that I have been reading the wrong section, unfortunately. But I'd like to say that it was all planned, because in reading the wrong section, I came across something that's rather intriguing, uh, even for tonight. The author of a uh, particular book on uh, Christian theology is... Uh, describing uh, different theologies today. Uh, he's not advocating these, but one of them is the secular theology, and this is what he observed. The whole cultural milieu with, within which theology has developed has been changing. God's activity was thought to be the explanation of the existence of the world and of what goes on within it, and he was the solver of the problems that humans faced. Today, however, many people put or many people in practice put their trust in the visible, in the here and now, and in explanations that do not assume any transcendent or supersensible entities. This different outlook came about through several channels. One was the growth in scientific explanations, whereas previously it seemed necessary to believe that some supernatural being or force had brought this great complex universe into existence, Alternative explanations are now available. Times past, the complexity of the, physical, uh, of the human physical organism seemed to point to some great, wise, and powerful designer. The theory of evolution, however, attributes human complexity to chance, variations combined with a competitive struggle for life in which those better able to adapt survive. Another reason for the change in outlook is that humanity has developed the ability to solve many of the problems faced in life. Biblical times, if a woman was barren, she prayed to God, and he answered by opening her womb so that a child was born. God was also believed to be the source of weather. In the time of Elijah, drought of three and a half years and an ensuing downpour were attributed to God. Now, however, if a woman who desires children is barren, a gynecologist prescribes a fertility pill, and with the addition of sperm, perhaps through artificial insemination, a birth, sometimes multiple, follows. If there is no rain for an extended period of time, someone seeds the clouds with silver iodide or some similar substance and it rains. Humanity can control birth and weather. Notice this statement. God is no longer needed. Now let me just say that in many regards, that single statement describes a tremendous amount of how people view things today. God is no longer needed. I've come this far. I've done it by myself. I'm the one who went to school. I'm the one who got that education. I'm the one who landed this job. I am the one who has climbed the corporate ladder of success. This is my life. I bought this house. I bought this car. I have created this environment. I did it all without God. Mankind today looks at problems and they naturally attempt to solve them on their own. I have achieved all of this, surely I am capable of solving the answer to this. If I can't, I'll just look it up on YouTube because someone else surely has already done this. I don't need God. And I would have to say that our society functions very much that way. Tragically, many Christians professing anyway claim uh, Christ, yet they likewise seem to ignore the reality of God. They seem to attempt to live their lives independent of who God is and of what God has done. Prayer for many becomes a last resort, not the first option. Prayer is 
Simply use exercise whenever it is needed. Our Christian life is often uh, left to kind of wither away and then all of a sudden lots of problems come in and, and well, man, you know what? Now I, I really need to, to get my life back on track and while that may be a good thing, oftentimes those things are very short-lived. God, I'm needing answers to this particular prayer, so I'll go ahead and spend some time with you today and uh, maybe even tomorrow if you haven't answered that prayer. No rush, Lord, but uh, at least three days and, and we should have this problem resolved. In case you haven't learned this yet in life, God does not work that way. But yet what we find is that there are increased, or increased numbers of individuals, both saved and unsaved, who attempt to live their life apart from God. In doing so, they live their life in defiance of who God is. We're going to talk today about the kingdom of Babylon, and it is a defiant kingdom. It is a kingdom that is going to seek to exercise its will apart from God. It's going to attempt to exercise its, uh, what, it does, what it decides it wants to do in spite of what God has commanded things, God has commanded things to be done. We'll observe in a little bit later on, Daniel chapters 1 through 4, we'll just mention them in, in passing, but yet what we'll see is Nebuchadnezzar who steps out onto his palace and he says, well, isn't this the, the great Babylon that I have built? Before we begin to look in some of these passages, I would suggest that there are a lot of Christians who would step out onto the palace of their life and say, is not this the great life that I have built? Look at everything that I have. Look at everything that I have been able to accomplish. Sometimes preachers have even stepped out onto the palace of their ministry and said, look at this great ministry that I have built. There's a problem with all of those mindsets. And that problem is that it is done in defiance of who God is. We can go out throughout history and we can find various notable empires and the rulers that led them. In some cases, the rulers formed a dynasty by having multiple generations from the same family continue to occupy the throne. The goal of many of these empires was simply put, domination. They wanted to completely dominate the entire known world. Civilization would continue to expand and various rulers would often vie for prominence and domination. The biblical scene will often center on the uh, dynasties of Babylon, for example, the Medes and the Persians, Greece and Rome. And here was Israel, a tiny nation that was uh, in vital geographical territory, and they were frequently right in the midst of various warring nations. Genesis chapter 11 is going to tell us of the account of the founding of Babylon, a city that from its very inception is regarded throughout the word of God as the epitome of being a rival both to God and his kingdom. Nothing in the word of God regarding Babylon is ever positive. You can find it in Genesis chapter number 10, and you can go all the way to the book of Revelation. I believe it's chapter 17. Don't quote me on the chapter number. But in that area, you'll find nothing positive about Babylon. Babylon is the essence of man's center, man's life, man apart from God. The account in Genesis chapter 11 of the infamous Tower of Babel has been portrayed in a variety of ways, and it has, in my opinion, created a great, de a great degree of confusion regarding the purpose of this event described in Genesis chapter 11. I don't know how you grew up uh, in Sunday school listening to the various stories. I can still picture some of the cards and flannel graph was still what they used back then. Uh, today, that's not quite the case. And we would stick a tower up on this felt board and, and uh, we would try to figure out what all was going on with this particular tower. Some see in this an attempt by man to work his way to heaven. That's always been what I recall anyway from Sunday school. That does not mean that's what the teacher said. That's just simply what I recall. Uh, I may or may not have been listening all that well, uh, but at least that's uh, the extent to which I recall. I don't personally think, although it is at least a possibility of an interpretation, I don't think that this is the preferred interpretation. Uh, one would think that surely these individuals living in this time did not believe they could actually build a tower that would reach into the very presence of God. Maybe they did, but I think they probably uh, did not. But what I will say is this, that 
argument would suggest that individuals are attempting to get closer to God. When I read the account of Genesis chapter number 11, I do not find individuals attempting to get closer to God. I find individuals attempting to get further removed from God. God's issued some very clear commands to spread throughout the entire earth, and man says that's not what we want to do. We want to dwell here, and we want to make a name for ourselves. We want to establish a reputation. And in my interpretation, we want to try to live a life apart from God. As we concluded our study last time, we briefly mentioned the content of Genesis chapter number 10 in a chapter that is commonly regarded as the table of nations. From the three sons of Noah, we discovered the beginnings of the various nations of the world. These are chronicled in Genesis chapter 10, as well as, uh, to an extent, some of the locations in which they settled. Ham's disgraceful act, recorded in the end of Genesis 9, brought about a curse that was extended to Canaan and his descendants. I believe that provided the necessary explanation to the Israelites concerning the curse of the Canaanites and the reason they were to be expelled from the promised land. Genealogical records are often difficult to read and understand. If we are not careful, we can brush over the material and treat it as though it is insignificant. I realize we did not go verse by verse through that. It is not because I feel that there is a degree of insignificance to it. My focus instead was to provide a general overview of the, that passage and the direction that it was going on. But I think a couple of things uh, need to be observed. The events recorded in Genesis 11, although they are following Genesis 10, actually occurred, I believe, chronologically before that of chapter 10. The events of Genesis 11 then would explain why these various individuals dispersed to these various territories. In many ways, Genesis 10 and 11 provide a genealogical record that is going to establish the nation of Israel. You take the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and you look at all of their various descendants, Ham and the Canaanites, Japheth, and various individuals that oftentimes are seen as being enemies of Israel, and then we'll see Shem and his descendants all the way down to Abraham in the end of chapter number 11. The details of this particular section of Genesis seem to be going from a shift of God's working on a universal level to that of God working on a national level and specifically with the nation of Israel and various individuals within that nation. As a whole, the nations of the world chose to reject God. God chose to develop his own people whom he would end up calling Israel. And so these two chapters, in many ways, serve as a bridge from the universal to the particular, from the nations as a whole to individuals and the founding of a particular nation. Within this broader section of Scripture, we discover there are two sections that I will say are parenthetical sections. And those serve as the focus of our study tonight. The first one is contained in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 12. The latter is contained in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. These actions, however, these sections should not be considered as separate incidents. Instead, they need to be regarded as relating to the same incident. Let's begin our study in Genesis chapter number 10 by noticing, first of all, the man Nimrod, and it's found in verses 8 through 12. You go, and we're not going to read all of the different names, but you, what you'll note before and after is so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, okay? It happens to take a little bit of a break from that. The Bible says in verse 8 that Cush, this would be the uh, oldest son of uh, Ham, begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, 
the mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kalha and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalha. The same is a great city. One of Ham's sons was a man by the name of Cush. Cush had a son whom he named Nimrod, the exact meaning of which is unclear. But the Bible describes him in several ways. First of all, the Bible says that he is a mighty man. This is the first time in the biblical record that we find an individual who is being described as mighty. Three different occasions you find the term mighty ascribed to Nimrod. We find it in verse number nine. Uh, I'm sorry, verse eight. We find it in verse number nine where we see that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And then we find it in First Chronicles chapter one and verse 10 where we read that Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be mighty upon the earth. The term itself is in reality a neutral term and it could be regarded as either complimentary or condemning. However, as we will discover, I believe that his fame as a mighty individual is not a compliment. Secondly, I would like you to notice that he was a rebellious warrior. Say, well, where in the world do you get that? Notice the phrase that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. There are a lot of questions as to uh, what was he hunting? Was he just a successful hunter who would go out and was very skilled at uh, killing game? It's a possibility. But I think there are some other possibilities, and I would tend to take it this way, that he was not a hunter of animals, but perhaps instead a hunter of men. It's actually used this way, Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16. In fact, hold your finger here, and uh, you'll see this word used the same way, and uh, the sense of it. Jeremiah 16 and uh, verse number 16. Here what you have is the, uh, in the context, you've got, uh, the nation uh, that is, has gone against Israel and they have uh, punished Israel and God's going to retri send the retribution to those nations. Verse 16, behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. They're not looking for fish in the sea and they're not looking for animals in the mountains. They are looking for individuals. It is my opinion that the sense in which Nimrod is described as being a mighty hunter before the Lord is probably best understood in the sense that he is a warrior, a mighty warrior, and as such has attempted to establish his own kingdom. It's, to me, the only way that the passage makes sense. Why would you have an individual who establishes a kingdom based on the fact that he is great at shooting squirrels? Or deer? Okay? Or whatever lives in that area, probably neither one. That's not going to be sufficient to establish a kingdom and have multiple cities that you now rule over. So it does not seem that it is this way. Now notice the phrase, before the Lord. This phrase here can be understood in a number of ways. It could be understood in the sight of the Lord, but I would suggest this way, that it is he is a mighty hunter in the face of the Lord, or we might say that he is a mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord. He is doing this in the very face of, of God. And I think as you begin to see what takes place in Genesis 11, this kind of a description fits him better than saying, man, this guy could shoot an animal from a long way. What does that have to do with anything? To me, it has nothing to do with it. And it's better explained if we understand this is an individual whose motives are done in such a manner as to be done literally in the face of God. I am going to do this in defiance of what God has said. And it is as though he is pursuing his actions with an air of 
arrogant disposition and a total disregard for God and his will. Does Nimrod establish this kingdom on the plains of Shinar in accordance with God's will? I do not believe so. You're going to be very hard pressed to suggest that the tower that is built in Genesis chapter number 11 is something that God desired and then he suddenly changed his mind. That in itself in Genesis 11 is an act that is inconsistent with God and his will. The fact that he was a powerful ruler instead of a successful game hunter, I think, is also confirmed by the establishment of his kingdom, which in Genesis 10 is known as Babel, another name for Babylon. Throughout the word of God, this kingdom, this city, is constantly portrayed as the epitome of opposition to God. Nowhere do you ever find Babylon as being seen in compliance with God and his will. And it is Nimrod who is responsible for the establishment of Babylon. I do not know Hebrew, but I have read uh, a number of commentators by individuals who know the language quite extensively. And I am told that the Hebrew suggests that the kingdom was the result of his strength in hunting. Once again, that would confirm to me that it is probably the concept of the hunting of men. If we take it this way, which I believe to be the correct interpretation, what we will say is that Nimrod was a very powerful, perhaps tyrant, but at least ruler, who forced his will upon the people. The Bible says that his kingdom consists of multiple cities that were all formed into one great city known as Babylon. Initially, it consisted, according to verse number 10, of the cities of Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and the land of Shinar. Then, verse number 11 teaches that he went out of that land to Assyria. And I think that probably is how this needs to be understood, to Asher, the the, uh, name would be for Assyria. He went out of it to Assyria, And he built Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Calah and Rezin between Nineveh and Calah. The same reference to Nineveh is a great city. What do you find positive between Babylon and Nineveh in the word of God? Nothing. There is nothing that suggests these are cities that are going to further God's work. They are both in opposition to to God. The Bible says that Nineveh, the same, is a great city. Is it great in God's sight? Probably not. Great in perhaps size? Perhaps. Great in its defiance of God? I would suggest so. One commentator suggested this is man's city, the secular city, It is of man, by man, and for man's glory. Probably summarizes it quite well. Without taking time to look in Daniel 1 through 4, I think it's familiar enough that I can bring some things back to memory from that. You recall in Daniel chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar, it was said, took the sacred vessels from the temple treasury and brought them to Babylon and placed them in the house of his God, according to Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 2. That act is more than just simply finding a storage facility for these sacred objects. That act presupposes that in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, his God conquered Israel's God. His God was superior to that of Jehovah. And admittedly, so it seemed for a time. One evening in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. You recall it had a a very great image that consisted of a head of gold. The uh, chest was uh, silver, the legs were brass, the feet were iron. This head that was gold represented the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. God himself said in Daniel 2 that this kingdom is a magnificent kingdom. But he then pointed out that he would one day be destroyed by another kingdom. 
Naturally, Nebuchadnezzar took from this, you are not the greatest. You will one day be defeated. Move on to Daniel chapter 3. You're familiar with the account. Here, Nebuchadnezzar erects an image that is, the Bible says, made of, more than likely, overlaid with what? Gold. Head to toe. All of it is gold. It's in many ways, as the Nebuchadnezzar is saying, my kingdom and all of my splendor is going to last forever, regardless of what God said in Daniel 2. Understanding that sure would explain why he was so angry with some individuals who said they weren't going to bow down to his image. It was more than the fact that he had a lengthy construction project going on. This was to him the glory of his kingdom. And these individuals, in refusing to bow down to it, refused to acknowledge the glory of his particular kingdom. A year later, Nebuchadnezzar walks out under the roof of his palace and he says, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? From its very inception, the kingdom of Babylon stood in opposition to God. Some have even suggested that perhaps Nimrod's actions were an attempt to reverse the curse placed by God on the descendants of Canaan. Quite an interesting concept. You said we're cursed? No, I'll show you we'll establish ourselves. We're not going to serve. You remember that was part of the curse? You're going to serve Shem and you're going to serve Japheth? We're not going to serve. We're going to rule. There's a lot, and I know we're getting into the, the area of supposition and we need to be very careful there. But if this is the right mindset, and I think that it is, then what we begin to acknowledge is there is a lot of arrogance and there is a lot of independence from God. I would also say that the, uh, in fact, let me move from the man Nimrod. Let's move on to, secondly, the kingdom of Babylon now in Genesis chapter number 11. Now we move, and this is, it goes from Genesis 10, verse 12, into, okay, verse 13, so-and-so begets so-and-so, blah, 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 through the end of chapter 10. Now we come across another parenthetical section of Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Let's begin by noticing, first of all, the defiance of the people. We would expect from the common ancestors that the earth would consist of one language and of one speech. As they journeyed from the east, the Bible teaches us that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. I uh, meant to bring the map in and put it up here on the slides, and I closed out of one window on my computer only to realize that's where the map was. And so uh, it's still there. The intention is certainly good. If you take the Arabian Peninsula and if you go up into the northeastern corner of it, there is a section. If you get a chance to look at a topographical map, you'll see a whole lot of brown and then a green section. That was a very fertile area. That is where all of this is taking place. They arrive to the land of Shinar and they choose to dwell there. Nothing necessarily to this point is wrong, although all of a sudden they say, you know what? We're going to stay here. Now there's a problem. God had told them to replenish the earth and to completely subdue it. His expectation was that they scatter. And so we see, first of all, the defiance of the people. The goal of the settlement was not to fulfill God's commands to subdue the earth. The goal of the settlement was to defy God. 
Once again, someone observed from the beginning of Babylon's goal was to resist any further scattering of the peoples over the earth and to create a city where the achievements of a united and integrated people would be centralized. So they failed to continue to expand and instead they decided to congregate. That leads us to the desire of the people, verses three and four. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and a slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That phrase, go to, you see it a couple of times in verses three and four. We could also understand this in the sense of come. Okay, uh, It's not saying we're going to go somewhere. Hey, hey, come together, guys. Let's accomplish this. What you find is their desire consisted of multiple things. Number one, they wanted a city. They said one to another, verse three, go to or come together, guys. Let's make some brick. And so they did this. They burnt them thoroughly. They had brick for or instead of stone. Slime or tar had they for mortar. We're going to start building a city. Now, let me just tell you, I know we oftentimes think of people in, in you know, previous generations as being dumb or ignorant, previous civilizations being ignorant. I believe they could run circles around us in lots of ways. If we can't Google it, we can't figure it out. <laughs> okay. Google, okay, I better stop before I turn someone's phone on. Uh, you know, how do I build a building? Well, that's easy. You begin, to, you know, heating brick up to such and such a point. They were not ignorant people. So let's get rid of that myth in our own minds. We want a city. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Is that so they could go directly into the presence of God? I don't think so. It makes no sense. They did not want to be scattered. This has nothing to do with God and the desire to be drawn closer to him. It has everything to do with their own sinful desires to build their own kingdom. They wanted a great city. Secondly, they wanted a known reputation. Verse number uh, four, let us make us a name. Hey, we want to be recognized. We want a reputation. We want to do this great achievement so that people will look at me and say, wow, what a person. Let me just caution you along the lines of doing things in order to become known, in order to establish your own reputation. Sometimes we get this concept that we live in the shadow of certain individuals and we say, well, you know what? I need to get out of that shadow. I need to go do something bold and I need to go do something daring. I need to go be my own person. I need to set up my life the way that I want to set it up. There are problems with that kind of a philosophy. We don't want to be scattered abroad, verse 4 upon the face of the whole earth. What did God say to do? Scatter. Go abroad over the whole face of the earth. And they say, no, that is not what we want to do. Although the text does not say it, and admittedly I branch into once again the concept of it being a religious center. Based on the sense in which Babylon is used throughout the word of God, I would suggest that their plan probably had at least a religious significance attached to it as well. But the sense of it is unable to be determined exactly. It could be that the top of the tower was dedicated to the heavens as a place of worship. That would certainly fit and is capable of fitting grammatically. Some have also suggested that it had a representation of the heavens or the zodiac upon it. I will at least say this, that it is very interesting to note that the study of the Zodiac originated in Babylon. You know the whole Zodiac thing? Uh, that you look up in the sky, whatever section you fall into, that determines your destiny. Uh, maybe that's what this tower was to achieve. 
possibility. Bible does not smile upon that kind of stuff, by the way. Stay out of it. I don't care what the newspaper says. Your hand does not rest in some section of the sky. Or or your, your life doesn't rest there. Your fate does not rest there. That's with God. But regardless, I do not believe God is the center of the worship here. But man surely is. We see in verses 5 through 8 the decision of God. The people gathered to rebel against God. God decided to address the matter. The Lord, Jehovah, came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. I, I can't help but read verse number 5 and think, you know what? Here they are establishing this thing that to them everybody is going to look at and wonder. They're building up. And God comes down. Man's greatest achievement lies far below God. God still condescended to man's greatest achievement. You know, he could have destroyed this. Maybe you've seen pictures of uh, lightning bolts striking it in flame and all that. There's nothing that indicates that happened. But he came down and he observed. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Once again, we see the wickedness of man and the center as it continues to go against God. The people are united. Unity is not always a good thing. They have all one language And they will continue, and nothing will stop them. Go to, another time we could say come. Let us go down, interesting with the Trinity, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. It is here that God divided the nations by creating language barriers. And I will have to say that God in his grace did this. This was in all actuality a gracious act of God to divide the people. And he did so. Interestingly, in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost is the reversal of this judgment for a brief time. Why? So that everybody could hear the good news of salvation. Interesting how God works, isn't it? Well, now their plan didn't work out so well. So we see thirdly, I'm sorry, fourthly, the desertion of the plan. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. God forced mankind to be scattered and spread abroad upon the face of all the earth. One commentator that I read pointed to several different words, uh, uses of the word come, or, or they translate, the King James translated by the words go to. The first time you see this, you find man to man. It was man saying this to man, and it was ultimately directed against God. Hey, come on, let's build us a city. Man to man against God. Second time you see it, verse number seven, was made by God to God, and it was directed against man. We're going to confound their language. But can I point out to you, there's a very gracious come that is made by God to man for man's salvation. Notice just a couple of passages. Isaiah chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 
Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Book of the Bible closes. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If you've not placed your trust in Jesus Christ tonight, I want to urge you to take advantage of that invitation. Here is an invitation by God to man for man's salvation. Man thought they had it all planned. Man thought they had it all worked out. We are going to build this city. We're going to stay right here and we're going to make a reputation for ourselves. God said, no, no, actually you're not. What you're going to do is what I told you to do. You're going to scatter in his, in his grace, God did that. But what I want you to see, notice how man says, hey, let's get together against God. God says to God, a punishment that is directed against man. But God says to man, here's salvation. Let me ask you tonight as the musicians come, have you trusted your, have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Maybe you have attempted to build your own kingdom. You've got your own tower going. You have designed a life apart from God. His commands are irrelevant. His worth doesn't make much difference because I am number one. The world has developed a secular theology in which God is not needed. I hope you don't look at your life and live as though God is not needed.